Hi, I'm Sheridan. I'm a grad student at Johns Hopkins, uh, and I'm really excited to talk to you today about my thesis work where I've developed a single cell long read sequencing data set um, of the adult mouse hippocampus uh, by using 10x genomics and Oxford Nanopore. Um, so I'm not going to belabor a lot of the biology, but I'm a neuroscientist and I'm absolutely obsessed with this biochemical phenomenon called activity-induced transcription. Um, so brain cells communicate with each other across points of contact called synapses. Um, and significant input activity at these points of cell contact oftentimes will elicit a transcriptional response in the receiving cell. Um, and so the prevailing model in the field is that these activated uh, activity-induced transcripts then traffic back to the synaptic locus of activity, uh, where they're locally translated into proteins that affect changes in synaptic strength. Um, and so it is computationally bonkers to me that like neurons are able to weigh the relative significance of potentially thousands of inputs and then make millisecond decisions on whether to fire or not fire. And their ability to do this is how we learn. It's how we consolidate memory. Um, and that's predicated on this activity-induced transcriptional response. So it's really important. Um, we know from early screens uh, using microarrays that activity-induced transcription involves thousands of genes. We know it's cell type specific and it involves alternative splicing. So you can imagine that all these layers of complexity um, compound to generate incredible transcript isoform diversity. And we're just starting to scratch the surface of that diversity with targeted studies of specific genes. Um, and these studies revealed that there are functional consequences um, to learning and memory as a result of this activity-induced alternative isoform usage. Um, but until now, we haven't really had a nice, unbiased way of probing um, this uh, isoform diverse response um, <clears throat> in a way that has been modernized to reflect the huge gains in sequencing technology that we've made since we were doing microarrays. Um, so I set out to make uh, a transcript isoform data set of, of the mouse hippocampus. Uh, with the intent of being able to ask, you know, what are the mRNA substrates of learning? I think in the field we tend to talk about learning as a protein phenomenon, as a cytoskeletal phenomenon, um, but the transcripts that are induced by learning events are just as important. Um, so I generated this data set by combining 10x genomics and Oxford Nanopore. Um, 10x genomics is a single cell cDNA library generation platform whereby single cells are sequestered into droplets with RT reagents and barcoded primers, such that all of the cDNA that arises from any cell is imbued with the same cellular barcode. So that when you pull all the cDNA together um, and sequence it, you're able to read out that cellular barcode on each of your reads, bend them back to the cell of origin, and you get this really nice counts per gene per cell matrix that you use for differential expression analysis. Um, obviously, I don't need to go into what nanopore is. That's why we're all here. Um, there are obvious uh, advantages to using 10x genomics, um, mostly in that it's really accessible. It's like an off-the-shelf kind of product, uh, and it has really high throughput. The problem is that the canonical 10x pipeline is intended for Illumina sequencing, um, so you fragment your reads. Um, and so what that does is, by design, gives you only gene-level information because you're restricted to capturing just the extreme three prime end of all your cellular transcripts. Um, but if instead you took this full-length barcoded cDNA and rather than fragmenting it, you sequenced it on Oxford Nanopore, theoretically you'd now have gene-level expression information, but all of this really juicy transcript isoform level information um, while retaining that single cell resolution. Um, so <laughs> this was like before all this fancy new Q20 chemistry and all that stuff, right? This was single cell isoform sequencing before it was cool. And what you had to deal with um, were error rates that were inherent to nanopore-based calling at the time. Um, and so one in every 15 base pairs being erroneously called might not seem like a big deal, but when your entire experiment is contingent on reading out a 16 base pair barcode, uh, even small error rates become a big problem. Um, so we adopted this method developed by Roger Volden and Chris Vollmer's lab at UCSC called R2C2. It's a nanopore um, error correction library prep uh, that involves circularizing all of the cDNA in your library. Uh, such that you generate these really long concatenameric molecules that contain repeats of the sequence of origin, um, so that when you sequence these concatenamers, you can collapse all of these repeats into a consensus read that's much more accurate than a raw nanopore read would be, with the intent of being able to read out or what we call demultiplex um, the barcodes that are on the ends of your reads and bend them back to the cells of origin, right? The whole single cell part of doing single cell transcriptomics. 
Um, so what I'm showing you right now is uh, a data set that's taken from one mouse hippocampus. Um, it's the, the cells have been through the 10x gauntlet. Half of the full-length cDNA goes into the canonical 10x pipeline um, where it's fragmented and sequenced on Illumina. The other half has gone into the R2C2 prep and been sequenced on Prometheon. Um, and what I'm showing you here is that uh, is TSNE representations of the representations of those two data sets, where you can see that we're able to pull out the same cellular communities um, with nanopore alone as we're able to pull out with Illumina. Uh, so this gives us a way to do uh, um, not only g typical like 10x canonical gene level expression information, uh, but we can do it without the need for Illumina, uh, which is nice because that's that much less money you have to spend per sample. Um, so we get the same quality of information with nanopore alone insofar as we get um, appropriate identification of our cell communities, um, but we have 10 times the average read length. And to show you functionally what that looks like, um, I've selected this one gene in PASS1 that's differentially expressed in inhibitory neurons, um, and these are just IGV plots from the same data sets that I just showed you the slide before. Um, and predictably for this gene, you can see that the Illumina reads all pile up on the three prime end. Again, that's by design, uh, but you could never discern between the annotated isoforms of this gene for the cell population. Um, I feel like it's pretty striking when you look at uh, the nanopore reads, um, the complete exon coverage that we're able to achieve with long read gives us the ability to easily identify which isoforms are present in that cell type. Um, so obviously being able to look at single cell transcript isoform level information is really useful for like a variety of applications. Uh, but as a neuroscientist, I'm trying to bring it back to uh, activity induced transcription. Um, so I'm not gonna talk that much about this, just understand that this is a classical fear conditioning paradigm that's used in neuroscience, um, whereby you put a mouse in a context, uh, while they're exposed to that context, you shock them, and so that now they've made an association about that context. They've learned something about their environment, and when you reintroduce them to that context, even in the absence of a foot shock, they freeze, they're scared. So it's a classic learning um, paradigm. So I have different time points, I have different learning conditions, um, but this is all just to show that with nanopore and R2C2 alone, no Illumina, um, we're able to pull out the, uh, these really beautiful representative cell type communities um, that we know exist in the hippocampus. Uh, and again, every single data point that you see, every cell that you see um, has reads that are around 900 base pairs on average. Uh, so that gives us uh, not only gene level expression information, but transcript level expression information. Um, and so this is just an example. This is kind of old data. So uh, on the right here, I only have one animal per group. Um, but you can see that like when we identify our isoforms and quantify them with salmon, um, we're able to, uh, to see genes that have predictable uh, transcript isoform expression patterns based on literature, like HOMER1 is kind of the poster child for activity-induced alternative splicing, um, and HOMER1A is an isoform that's rapidly and transiently induced upon activity, um, and we can see even at like a kind of eagle eye view uh, that that's sort of the pattern that we're able to see. So it's kind of a sanity check for our isoform quantification. Um, so if this conference were a week from now, I'd have a lot of like spicy differential transcript expression information to show you for all of these different cells. Um, but I just rounded out my data set and I'm analyzing that data as we speak. But once, I'm due, once I do, I'm confident that um, I'll be able to identify learning-induced transcript isoforms with the ultimate goal of looking for shared features of these learning-specific transcripts uh, that might convey or give us clues as to how learning and memory is regulated at the RNA level. Um, and again, this is something that's really only possible very recently and with long read sequencing. Um, so with that, I wanna thank Winston Temp and everyone in his lab for always empowering me to do my passion project. Um, I wanna thank the organizers for letting me speak about my research and you for your attention. Thank you.